So who figured out God the best? And the answer is, like I was getting at earlier, nobody figured out God the best. You can reason. Some Greek philosophers did a pretty good job. But God has to tell us who he is. And I want you to kind of think about this. He is. He just is. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. The Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man, and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And we're not concerned with anyone's opinion, for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin. He said to them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that he said to them, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. What I want to do today is just talk about some basics that will help us maybe uh, how we think about God so that we can actually uh, maybe have a relationship with him and it's informed by the truth. Um, as I said earlier, we're finite. We can reason about God. You know, philosophers can say, believe it or not, uh, even in the ancient world, there were philosophers who reasoned there had to be one God for perfection. There had to be one God. They could reason that. But that's not really typically what what human history shows us. Human history shows us that we tend to make mistakes because God is infinite. And I'll try to explain a little bit of that later. And we're finite, right? We've got a five-pound bucket, and God is an ocean. So here's some basics, right? The first line of the creed uh, that we learned, this is the Nicene Creed. Later on, we'll say the Apostles' Creed. But the Nicene Creed, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. So, let's take a look at some of that. What does it mean when we say uh, that God is creator? Right? Well, here's a good way to think about it. Here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that God is the biggest, most powerful being in creation. Did you see the distinction of that? Okay. God is beyond creation. I'll get into how he's present to his creation. But just like Mr. Jackson was talking about Zeus and Mount Olympus, right? What is, what was the mythological understanding of God's place? God was the most powerful being in a universe that was eternal. So Apollo and Zeus and, and Athena, right? The, the most powerful beings, like you'd see in a movie or something, right? That's not what God is. God certainly is the most powerful being. But when I say not in creation, the reason why this is important is because we, we need to kind of start thinking of God as beyond creation, infinite, perfectly happy in himself. Creation had a beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Before there was anything created, before there was any angels, or planets, or matter, or even human souls, there was just God, perfectly content to be God. And so God is distinct. Or should I say, there's God, and there's everything he created. That's the biggest division. We call that divine nature. And we'll talk about what that divine nature is, or at least I'll, I'll try to explain it something that's very important for you, even if that other one is kind of hard to figure. God is not the universe. That's pantheism. Okay? God is not the universe. 
In the last decade or so, people have been speaking in a way like, the universe has a place for you. You know, I, I don't know if you've caught any people, like uh, college graduations and things like that. They use the word universe because nobody says the word God anymore. Right? No, no. God has a purpose for you. The universe, the universe doesn't know anything. Right? The universe is like stars and other things like that. So, God is not the universe, he's not creation, he's not identical with his creation, and he's not in creation if you think of like a rolling God or a green God, like the strongest thing. So, the question comes up, does God exist? Does God exist? So the first way of trying to say, okay, God, you know, do you exist? Well, the first way we'd say it is, well, there's creation, right? It had to get here somewhere, okay? Now, a lot of people say, yeah, but we've got science now. That tells us that we didn't need God to do that. Okay. But there's a larger, deeper issue to that. I want you to kind of think about this. There is a thing called existence, right? In other words, why is there something rather than nothing? Why isn't there completely nothing? If we're here... We know there's a thing called existence, right? We exist. The world exists. So, one way of saying there must be a God is that the world had to come into existence. But there's a deeper dimension to it. Existence exists. There is thinginess. There are things. And when you think about God, that's the first aspect of God. He exists. Before there was any moons, or planets, or angels, or dogs, or whatever, it was just God, because that's all that existed. Right? I know this is like, you get, we probably have some smoke coming out, but just, it's just something to think about, like, like, we know there's a thing called existence. The first way to think of God is, He is existence. He is. He just is. Right? That's big. There is a God, as opposed to there is no God. How do we know this? Where do we tell this? Uh, well, in the Bible, Moses is called by God to free the people. And he says, who am I supposed to tell them sent me? Almost implying, should Ra, the war god, send me? Or Zeus send me? No, no, no. God just says, tell them, I am who I am. I am sent you. The one who is the source of all existence sent you. That's who God is. So the next question comes, and I was talking about this earlier. Um, so who figured out God the best? Who figured out God the best? And there's so many religions. So if you get to the point where you say, okay, all right, I believe in God because, I don't know, it just makes sense to me. Or I can reason about the fact that existence exists, so God exists. This thing that creates existence. But who knows who God is? There's thousands of religions. And the answer is, like I was getting at earlier, nobody figured out God the best. You can't figure out God the best. We can reason. Some Greek philosophers did a pretty good job. But God has to tell us who he is. Because he's infinite. He's well beyond us. And we're finite. So when we as Catholics say, you know, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we don't say that because someone, some smart person thought of it, right? It's because Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, revealed it to us. That's why the, Jesus is called the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth itself. God himself came into the world to reveal himself to us. And so that's when we trust Jesus, that's us trusting God. That's us trusting in his truth because he came to us. Right? Jesus is not just a prophet. He's the only guy in the world that's not a prophet. Except, when we get to the gospel here, uh, you know, what they said about Caesar, which was, was blasphemy. Okay, so. So where is God? Where is God? God is everywhere. Yay, right? Why? Mr. Jackson was talking about this. Because he's not material. He's not, he doesn't have dimension. So in a sense, and it's hard to think, well, how can something that has no dimension be everywhere, 
right? Well, that's the nature of, of spirit. He's, he penetrates everything by virtue of the fact that he has being. He's the ground of all being. We like to say that if God, God willed you in love and sustains you in love, you're here because God loved you even before you were. And you're still here because God continues to love you and keeps you in existence. He's the source of being. It's like the earth that gives the earth that gives nourishment to the plants. It's like the source of it. That's God is our source. He's, he's, the, he's the undergirding, the underground, the, the, the first step of what makes us or causes us to exist. As such, God, this is what I'm saying, is God the greatest thing in creation? And I said no, and you're like, that doesn't make any sense. Well, this is where I was going, right? Yes, God is present to everything in creation because he holds everything in existence. So who is he present to? Right? Us. Right? God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows our thoughts. Right? He knows our motivations. Now, I'm going to make you feel a little better. That might make you embarrassed, because God knows when you're sinning too, right? But, this will make you feel a little better. An angel can't read your thoughts. Another human being can't read your thoughts. Some, some human beings are pretty dang good. My brother's a salesman. He can, he, can, he, he can almost hear you think. It's crazy. Salesmen are like that. They, they, they intuit what you want to hear, so, you know, that kind of thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, like, literally, your secrets or things you're holding secret. Nobody can, nobody can read your mind. Not even an angel. Not even the devil. Although the devil kind of, he's pretty smart. He kind of knows which direction we're going because he's, he can watch. But God knows us because he's God. He's divine. Everything else is a creature. So I'm saying, there's God and there's everything else. And God is with us and knows us and loves us. One of the other things we know about God, right? What was the first one we heard? The Father Almighty. Right? God is infinite because he has no material dimension. He is perfect. He is the source. Right? So, uh, not only is the source of being, but he's the source of truth, the source of goodness, right? the source of perfection. This is what God is. We, he shares that with us. If God, if God is all powerful. Can God lie? Can God sin? Can God change the commandments? Can God just say, you know, tomorrow murder is going to be the best thing you can do to another human being? No. All these things are expressions of God's truth. God is not going to contradict himself. And here's the most important thing to think about when it comes to sin, or lying, or hurting people, or corruption. It's actually not a something. Right? Evil is the absence of good. Evil, if you think about it, is like the absence of godliness, because God is all good, and the source of all good. Evil is something missing that should be there. So God can't lie because... Lying is not something. It's an absence of truth. Evil isn't something. It's the absence of good. The best example on this is uh, a rotten apple. Right? right? An apple is corrupt. Right? It's got all the brown stuff in there. And it's all soft. That, that's not a thing. That's an absence of a thing. It's the absence of healthiness and fruitiness and freshness. And goodness, it's rotting. And that's what you're seeing. You can point to it and say, ooh, that thing's rotting. But what's not there? Life is not there. So God is all-powerful, is almighty, is in all things. But God can't lie. Because God is truth. And a lie, like I said, is a nothing. It's nothing. And God is being. So uh, that tells us um, something really great. God is personal. Right now, everything we've been talking about is the sort of God as the unknown. God the infinite. God the, the, the you know, who made the universe God? Or what are the qualities of God? But God wants us to have a relationship with him. 
God is personal. You know how we say we're made in the image and likeness of God? We're persons, this thing that we think of as personhood. God has that first. And that's the image we're made in so that we can have a relationship with God. So God is a person. God isn't just the divine watchmaker who made the universe. Okay, we, we solved that problem. Now we know why the universe is here. Thank you, God. No, right? God wants a relationship with us. It's almost that's what I'm getting at. Like, God is everywhere, in everything, within ourselves, is all good, all truth, wants a relationship with us in love. And we sometimes just kind of think of, well, you know, what do I think about God? We don't really talk about it too much. It's the exact opposite. Like, God is everything, right? God is the most important thing. Now, God wants us to live a good life, loves our families, all that. But the point is, God is the source, the beginning and end of everything, right? So that's kind of, and it's a personal thing. It's not just this unknown thing. And that's why we're made the way we are. That's why we have an intellect, right? So we can know him. And a will, so we can love him back. Um, it's a great question. I love this question. When I was your age, it was probably the first time I heard it. Maybe I was a little older. Um, why did God create us if he was perfectly happy by himself without us? Because he knew there would be creatures that would want to exist. God made you because he knew he would want you to exist. He knew you would love life. And then he takes that creation of you and enters into a relationship with you of love. And it's of truth. And I'll, I'll kind of close with that. God is love. God is not an emotion. God is a relationship, a relationship of love. That we are made with intellect and will to do what? Enter into that relationship. God wants us to enter into his inner life. That's why we're baptized. That's why we receive the Eucharist, so that we can have the inner life of God within us. So, in the Gospel today, we see a couple different things. Um, first, the Pharisees wanted to trick Jesus, right? So they're the religious, religious authorities. And who do they go to to conspire to trap Jesus? You might not have been able to recognize the word. The Herodians. Who were they? Herod. They were, the, they were the, the ruling party. They were the ones who were the vassals of the Romans. Right? The Pharisees and the Herodians did not like each other. Okay? Because the Pharisees... But, apparently, the Pharisees are starting to sell out their own people here. Right? But what... This is critical, really. Just a little lesson right in there. Two groups who hated each other conspired because they hated the truth more. It's amazing. Jesus Christ, the truth, is sitting right before them, and they want to trap him. And what's the trap? If he says, pay the tax, he's a traitor to Israel. If he says, don't pay the tax, tax he's a traitor to, to Caesar. So, what does the Lord say? He says, Can we, is it lawful to pay the census tax or not? And Jesus says, as we heard, uh, give me that Roman coin. <laughs> right? And, uh, and he says, whose image is on it? We said, Caesar. And, and he says, and inscription. The inscription on the Roman coin, right, was something like divine Caesar or God on earth, God among men, right? Caesar, the Caesars, started proclaiming themselves gods. And so that coin was actually blasphemous in addition to being, you know, sort of like a, 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 a bad memory that the Romans had, had conquered Israel. So what does Jesus say? Whose image is on the coin? Caesar's. Then give the coin to Caesar. Which actually what that tells us is we do support the world. We are supposed to pay our taxes. That's a small level. But what's the next twist that he does? He says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Render unto God what is God's. And so the question he's asking us is, in whose image are you stamped? The coin has Caesar's image stamped on it. Give it to Caesar. God stamped himself on you, on your soul. You're stamped in his image. So the Lord is saying, give yourself to God. Because we know God, and we're learning about God. What do we know? What do we know? 
if we need to rely on the Lord, who wants to have a loving relationship with him. Right? He cannot lie. Lying would be a contradiction. God does not lie to you. Humans might. God does not. God loves us. So God does not coerce our love back. God doesn't just go, snap his fingers and go, oh, all of a sudden, you're now a holy person. Boom, all of a sudden, you know, no. God does not, God allows our freedom. Because if we don't have freedom, then we can't have love. So that's why it's so tricky. That's why it's so hard uh, to be a disciple because he's eliciting from us love out of freedom. St. Augustine has this very interesting line. It's the greatest thing in the world. How does God change our wills without coercing it or abusing the will? And he says, by attracting it through desire. Attracting it through desire. You can come to God just by the pursuit of beauty. You can come to God just by the pursuit of truth. That's how I became a priest, by the way. Right? I didn't start off wanting, I didn't start off wanting to be a priest. Right? I started off wanting to do what everyone else, you know, I wanted to, I was in the military and I wanted a family and a wife and, and some spark hit me. And I started following the truth in the truth of the church, the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth in prayer. And next thing you know, here I am. But that's also a journey. So it's a journey of truth and of love. And that's open to everybody. It's open to everybody. You can take any truth of the faith that you find attractive and learn about it. And you can go deeper and deeper into all the other aspects. So God does not lie to us. He loves us and attracts us, does not coerce us, does not abandon us. Can't abandon us. Why? Because he's there. He's there. He's everywhere. He doesn't abandon us. We may forget that he's there, but he can't abandon us. Now, God does allow suffering in the world. Why? Because he allows freedom. And he allows creation to be what creation is, in love, which can make it very difficult for us sometimes, and our families, and our life, and our physical ailments, eventual death, pain, suffering, evil in the world. And so his answer, like I said, isn't to just snap his fingers like to change our, our minds and change our free will or change the world in a second and a half. His answer is to enter into that suffering with us. And we'll talk about that as we go along. Jesus answers it to God's answer to suffering, which we create, is to enter that suffering with us, to support us and be with us. So, when we say God is almighty, God is father, God is love, it means all these things. God does not lie. God does not abandon us. We can rely on God, and uh, he's with us in all the ups and downs and joys and struggles in the world. That's who he told us he is, and he cannot lie.